into my cellar again. Before I get fully into this, I wish to point something out. You've noticed the spiffy cap already. Well, now I am fully equipped to go mutant hunting in my scientific barbarian. I came, I saw, I left a crater. Not much you can say to that, except I gotta put my back arrest back, or my back support back in so I don't look like I fell out of my chair. Sorry for that, but I thought you'd wanna see that shirt. I think it's pretty cool. And this is the first time I wore it. I washed it when I got it, and now I'm wearing it just for this. Okay. Well, I've just found this today and look forward to catching up on them all. That was five days ago, which means that this individual's been watching him steady ever since. No bathroom breaks, no sleep, no nothing. They still got a day and two-thirds to go. Uh, good. I hope you enjoy them. And uh, if you run across something way back in the way back when... And you need a clarification on it? Well, that's fine. Um, I remember playing a game, a great game my buddy ran. My cleric caught some insect-borne illness trudging through the frost marsh. Man, I must have been some tough insect if it was in a frost marsh. It didn't freeze. Uh, on the way to and from the dungeon, on top of having his mail nearly corroded to rust by the end. Even after we left the marsh, we had an arduous journey back to a settlement large enough to have healers who could cure him, and he barely survived reaching it. One of the best adventuring experiences I ever had. I, I doubt I've had as much fun. If I was high enough to level just to cure the disease, I doubt I'd, oh, I, I doubt I'd have as much fun if I was high enough to level just to cure the disease on the way. Good point. I mean... Every one of us that's played uh, more than half a dozen times has a favorite memory. And those of us that have played hundreds of times have many of them. Um, for whatever reason. Yours was a harrowing trek back through the outdoors to get your, uh, uh, your companion healed. And almost not making it. Um, Memories of what happens in these shared adventures are not a lot different in form than memories shared around campfires of uh, people, other people having done real life things. Um, you remember the fun, you remember the details, the harrowing escapes of all that. That's great. It made an impression on you. You had a good time doing it and it stuck with you. And I understand what you say. It wouldn't have been as much fun if you could just sit here. I heal you. I understand. Of course, being able to say here, I heal you, could have led to other adventures. We won't go there. Uh, uh, in regard to the continual light spell, I always like to take a hooded lantern, place some mirrors on the inside of it to reflect and intensify the light, and then cast continual light inside the lantern. Now you have a bright light source that you can turn off at will. Okay. Uh, the trick would also work without the mirrors inside the lamp. Yeah, it certainly would. Um, I've, I've had um, various applications and, and adaptations of this concept presented to me in, as a DM, and I'm okay with it. Uh, if you want to get real precise, and I've had people tell me they have a small lantern with a ref you know, polished silver or polished brass or whatever reflector behind it to amplify the light and focus it. That's fine. That's cool. The, just the concept is an item that it will always show your way. Now, I um, have always liked just taking a nearly translucent quartz crystal, casting the light inside the crystal, uh, the crystal being on top of a staff, or at the end of a wand, or at the end of a handle, depending upon the wielder, with a sack on the end, kind of like what you put over the head of a golf club. Of course, it has to be uh, 
impermeable to light. However, however you want to do it. The point is, work something out and you've got it. And it's, you, it, There's lots and lots of ways to work around spells only being able to use once. And later we're going to talk about some other aspects of that uh, position. Um, found an interview from 2002 on the Dungeon Delver with Gary. Gary speaks of the main theme of the D&D movie. Yeah, that was that crappy one that came out then. Something about an artifact that liked, but not, the Rod of Seven assembly to take over a bunch of worlds. He also discusses his dislike of second edition. Yeah, well, um, I really don't know how much input or control Gary had in any of those other crappy beginning movie, you know, movies before the last one. I have no, I have no idea. Um, the fact that he didn't like second edition, I'm not surprised at all. Ask anybody that's made something, how I, they like somebody else's idea of how it should have been. Now, in this case, I think it was an improvement, if only for the clarifications of the spellings and the uh, left out text and things like that. Um, look forward to your new modules. As a younger, we played Holmes Basic, then to AD and D. Eventually, played some Boot Hill, a little Gamma World. But my true favorite, neck and neck with D and D, was Top Secret, first edition. I love the James Bond films, the early ones. Any thoughts or experiences with Top Secret? I found it odd how different it was with the D100 system and radically different from the other games. It always seemed hard to find players though. Odd for the time, long before the huge fantasy failures, when Bonds and other spy stuff was much more popular. Um, I have very little experience with Top Secret. Um, I, I, I may have I may have done some beta designing or beta testing or whatever. Um, I don't believe I actually played in it, but I may have. Uh, I may have. I may have done some what ifs or how tos. Posed them as questions. In 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 a development sense, I don't know. I didn't know Merle until a few years ago uh, with uh, Guy Gags Magazine, so I I had little input with the designer just feedback to uh, Brian as I recall um, don't get me wrong I, I think the I think the system is good I think the concept is good um, I, but I'm not surprised that it doesn't have the massive the massive uh, uh, appeal of fantasy or science fiction it's definitely a niche. It's not to say you can't have a great campaign going. Um, not having played an adventure of Top Secret, I'm really, I'm really not uh, conversant with the mechanics of, of how it works around the table. I was only asked to comment on the original design. Now I understand Merle has put it, well, I know that Merle has put out a new edition and I only know that it's been put out. Um, it was originally TSR Games when Jason Elliott revived the, or recaptured the trademark and then let it lapse and then we had all the last to shit. Um, but, uh, and then it became Solarian game, and I don't know where Top Secret sits at, at this point with whom. I think it's a big disappointment to uh, Merle and to the, the, the hardcore fans of the game that it's kind of in a floating in a limbo weird state right now. I can make some comments that would get me crucified for being a sexist pig on the other reason that it probably uh, never caught on.
when you think of the Bond movies, you think of good music and and car chases and neat weapons and of course what made James a sexist swine. Um, question on original cyanic power attack defense. Did you come up with the names like or that you know, for example, uh, ego whip it insinuation of these from any source material is just your gray matter. As best as I can remember, I just came up with those one weekend when I was working on psionics. And now I might have, there, there's a possibility, 30, 40%, that I might have consulted with Gary on polishing some of what I'd come up with. That's possible. It cer I didn't, I certainly didn't consult with uh, Dave on any of this because he was, you know, he, <laughs> he didn't like anything we did. Um, yeah, I probably came up with most of it out of my head. Man, that was a long time ago. Whew. Almost 50 years. Hmm. Um... I read Jack Vance's Dying Earth series, and the wizards in these stories have as many artifacts and wondrous items as they do spells pressed into their brains. I'd like to see more campaigns where wizards are played more like that as keepers of weird stuff as well as arcane incantations. It makes for a great novel or short story. It's a nightmare in a campaign because a lot of what you're referring to are game busters. And don't think you can look at it and go, game but Some player somewhere will figure out how to bust his DM's game with great, wonderful artifacts like that. Um, you know, Lord have mercy. Uh, imagine a campaign l l laden with stuff uh, as, power as powerful as the Hand of Ecna. Not doing what it did, but being that powerful in doing whatever it was it did. Those are those are campaign busters. Great story items. Great plot devices. But as a DM, whoo, no way do I want that. No, every one of those. Um, again, we'll, we'll talk some more about this. Um, there's ways to get around the limitations of spells that you need frequently. They're called potions. Um, yeah, game-busting spells and game-busting artifacts. A game-busting artifact as the object of a quest or a search or a delve, okay. But be very, very careful, DMs, because there's always a monkey that sticks his finger in the socket. Except this time it won't just fry his little inquisitive butt, but it'll disrupt the whole game. Just think about that. Now, there's a response to this. Most D&D campaigns I have played in had players with gobs of magic items that they'd got from their adventures. If you look at published D&D adventures, there are all sorts of magic items. These can end up in the care of the PCs if they get them. So that aspect of fancy and fiction is certainly in the game. And in response to that, the original poster, those magic items aren't usually really in the same vein, though, are they? Aren't they usually charged with spells or convey bonuses to defense or attributes, mostly combat-oriented? I'm thinking of the more strange, unique items that aren't balanced. Well, as I said earlier, Balance is everything to a DM. He wants a good balance. Wherever that might be, if it's a little bit in the player's favor, okay. Because every once in a while it'll go back into the against the players. It should anyway. Otherwise it's just a Monty Hall giveaway. Um Balance is very, very, very important. If you, if, the, if you lose your sense of balance in the campaign, your campaign will 
spin out of control. Pardon me. I need to set up here. There we go. All right, next one. Troll Lords republishing some of Gary Castle's agate work. After 15 years, maybe I'll finally get the copy I ordered before she who shall not be named, oh, the widow, uh, stops shipments. Luke has supported me, supported this on a podcast recently. All right, here's a few things that I know about what all is going on with the widow. The heretofore hidden will was accepted as the authentic will. So a whole lot of bequests and bequeaths and blah, 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 uh, uh, are going to be different. They are selling off some of Gary's most prized game items. They recently sold his um, Dungeon Master's Guide, which also had Tramp Signature, and a couple of others I don't recall right now, um, but Tramp being incredibly rare um, for 28 grand. The estate of Gary has incurred the children, the one, the 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 two, one of the two parties, the widow and the children, have incurred enormous expenses. So someone's been appointed by the court to uh, oversee dispensing of this stuff. Now I don't know yet what happened to all of the uh, trademarks that the widow had, but I'm imagining that she'll be forced to give a bunch of those up if they have any monetary value whatsoever. Speaking of monetary value, a little bird informed me that in the midst of all this, it was determined that there is very little of the $300,000 that the widow was supposedly sitting on for the memorial. It's almost all gone. That's what the bird tells me. Expenses. A 5013C is a federal designation for tax purposes. A 5013C requires certain provisions, certain forms to be filled out, and uh, an audit by an independent individual every year. Now, I didn't just, somebody didn't tell me this. I was involved with a 5013C here in the greater Cincinnati area for 20 years. Every year we went through filing the paperwork, getting the audit completed, etc. We had to account. That never got done. For many years there was no accounting, no paperwork filed at all. It's too bad somebody couldn't take away the rest of that. And if somebody tries to tell you that it went for the park bench, don't believe it, the city paid for the park bench. <sighs> okay, here we go. A number of episodes ago, you mentioned the abhorrence, mine too, of hit location for combat. Who submitted the extensive tables in Blackmore Supplement? I wouldn't use them... But if a DM wanted a system, seems well thought out. All right, I couldn't find uh, somewhere down in my basement that's in a great state of flux right now. I couldn't find my copy of Blackmore, um, my PDF of Blackmore. And so I'm going to rely on a very, very uh, long memories. I'm willing to bet that they were presented by Arneson. Um, Dave did present some charts and tables that left me up to figure out what they were for, but I would imagine something like that. I'd say there's a 75 or 80 percent chance that that was something that Dave presented. Again, everything was optional. Even every, even the combat that wasn't everything a D6 was optional. I don't like them 
at all because you will chew through char player characters at a much faster rate. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're going to use hit location so that you can chop at the giant's ankle, then he could possibly swing his great scythe and cut you off at the knees. You're not dead yet. Maybe then somebody will stop the bleeding and carry you home. But you're going to be on stumps. Now, I'm, don't anybody please, I'm not trying to offend anybody that's differently abled. But we have to, you know, we have to look at this from a practical dungeon master point of view. The large feline thing that you fought and, and chewed you up pretty good, literally chewed you up pretty good, and you're missing a hand. Or you're missing several fingers on a hand. Well, if it's your sword hand, retire the character. No more adventure for him. Um, if you're going to get into hit location, now your healing times are prohibitively long in terms of game time. Now you need a stable of characters. Who can play today? Who's in the area? I don't like hit location. If you want to use it to apply it to the monsters, the same applies to you. Very few player characters survive decapitation. All right, I thought of an interesting question to pose. I've been working on an adventure idea for a system that is new to me, so I started by developing some design worksheet forms to help organize my workflow. At what point did internal design forms become integral in writing adventures and supplements at TSR? To my knowledge, never. While I was there, and for several years after I left, the idea of a standard form for anything except payroll is ludicrous. Just isn't going to happen. Didn't happen. Um, now, that's not to say that a lot of us didn't go about certain things the same way. <laughs> but that was more by accident or design technique than conscious effort. And then the rest of the question, were they considered useful? We never used them. We never looked at them. I mean, come on, man. We're looking at 1975, 1978. Um, <laughs> no. I, 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 no. I don't know if it was ever written anywhere on an optional rule or not, but in our game, healing was always a bit of a hassle and slowdown if you only allow the cleric to have one cure light wounds memorized, for instance. Our solution was to allow the character to burn any of their other first level spells as cure lights instead when desired or needed. This gave the cleric a bit more healing power and they didn't need to memorize cure light as a spell so they, they had more options of other utility or combat spells memorized. Maybe that would seem be seen as too much healing by some but it ended up working well in our game. That's great. That's great. Um, I believe in potions. I'm a great fan of potions. Um, I'm all about small clay jars or glass jars. Um, in my Wheel of Blame game, all the pre well, in fact, all my pregents carry Cure Lights and Cure Serious. Or Cure Heavy, depending upon which rules you're using. Anyway, you know, 1d6 plus 1, 2d6 plus 2, okay? Um, lots of them. I kind of tend to look at them like Red Bulls. Or your, name your favorite caffeine drink. Um, five hour energy, whatever. Because again, in my world, the concept of hit points is not blood and, and slices and dices. 
it's fatigue and 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 uh, slight slowing of the reflexes and those type of things until finally so boom here let's restore some energy now I let them take all of them they want however if they get reckless with them <laughs> a couple of times I've had to uh, uh, demonstrate I because I say you you sure about that you're gonna oh yeah, yeah I want to take it and they, you know, they're trying to buff up to original hit points. And, you know, they take three or four of them, you know, trying to get up there, up there, up there. Well, then I'll get them so wired that they're running around speed freaking and uh, lots of negatives. So in my world, the way I play, there there is Red Bulls or Five Hour Energies or any, you know, whatever. Um whatever your favorite one is that's how they work in my world because of the concept in my world of hit points they're not staunching bleeding there might you know now I'm not saying that in a, in a series of combats that your player character might get some scratches and, you know, and stuff like that those are the close calls but it's not going to cut your bicep in half so you bleed out. Um, and it is okay. And so this this individual had a response. It's an interesting approach. I've always been interested in the different homebrew solutions we players use when rules get fuzzy. I I always I was always a no take backs DM, so you're stuck with whatever you selected. And for those of those for which you have a, a comp components until the next day, unless you have recourse to another spell. Okay. All right. The the the, the uh, commenter goes on to point out that uh, that's what you know. Spell books are for learning new stuff, recording new stuff, and if it becomes known that you have a spell that no other wizards in the area have because this individual also encourages research which I used to encourage heavily in the Carbondale campaign and I've told you before I, there's one guy there that had probably close to a dozen variations on a fireball um, there were you know other things that would, would you know I'm something go uh, um, I, I want my donkey not to have to get flies in his eyes and irritate him. Okay. Take about two weeks of game time, 700 gold pieces, and three lizard tongues. Okay, that was the research. Now he's got a spell. He can throw it on his donkey's eyes, and they'll never, he'll never get bugs in him again, which makes the donkey more sure-footed, more docile. You know, flying, okay. I'm all for that in ingenuity, especially magical ingenuity, especially for practical everyday things. Some of the favorite, some of my favorite short stories I've read over the years were set in places where. Everybody had mild, ma what I call mild magic or low magic. Candle lighters, candle snuffers, oven starters, you know, ma magic pots that, that cook dinner. I think that it'd be fun to play in a magic rich environment like that, I think. I really do. Excuse me a minute, I found a note here stuck to my notes. I want to see if it got stuck there by accident. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Must have taken that one sometime after midnight. I'll have to figure it out later. Sorry for the interruption. Um... Okay, um, the, the, he also uh, goes on to say 
that um, he tried to he tr as a DM he tried to make him too scared to try putting all their eggs in one basket magically for fear of what might happen. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I always figured let them try. That's the way they'll learn. Um, and <laughs> kind of like <laughs> sending children out into the yard. Um, let them try. Okay. Been catching up on the videos. A, th a few things to ask. Yeah, more than a few. Um, commenters said they wanted the players to try other additions. Okay, one way they could do it to have their players in the game sent to another plane. Well, that's how one of Gary's wizards is will always be on the warden. Um, we used to do that with some 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 frequency. We cross over and do stuff like that. Um, be, be shortly before I came to TSR, Gary published an, uh, an article in the Strategic Review called Sturm Geschütz and Sorcery. That was a game that they played on their sand table that had uh, orcs, <laughs> orcs and, 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 and an ogre or so, and, and it involved an armored car and a machine gun and it, it was it was really it was very entertaining to read, and I imagine it was a ton of fun to play. Um, and so there's there's no you know, and he goes on to say that you could even um, switch mechanics by stuff doesn't work that way here now where you are. Okay. Second one, I know you like video games. No. No, no. I'm not a shooter. I'm not a sword fighter. Any of that stuff. What I play are turn-based games that you can play on a computer. Okay. Age of Wonders 4, you're not out there singing a sword or anything, doing anything like that. Civilization, games like that. That's what I like. I like them because I can play them on a computer. I don't have to worry about my knucklehead cat, Luca, jumping up on the pool table where I got the game spread out and knocking my whole offensive for a loop. I like the convenience of being able... I like turn-based strategy games. I like some board, I play some board games online. Now I know it, well, I went and looked up Baldur's Gate and that, and it's pretty, and it's, that's just not, not my bag. I'm not into video games, I'm into turn-based strategy games that I can play on a computer. <laughs> I know it's a fine definition to some of you. Um, All the newer 5e players are having culture shock as it actually uses the rules as written and doesn't fudge dice to protect them when they're struggling with the difficulty. Well, good. I got news for you. Age of Wonders is a damn hard game, too. I haven't won one yet. Can't tell you how many times my, my leader's been killed and my faction therefore lose. <clears throat> I wouldn't play the game if it was fun and easy. But I would play it if it was fun and hard. All right, I'm considering writing an agnostic setting book guide based on fantasy version of my own, hoping to sell it and use the money to fund my club efforts. Are there any things you, they, you'd advise as must-haves in a book and or, and or avoid at all costs? Any tips would be great. Things have been slow with the club due to my work and becoming a father again. To an awesome little lass called Mirabelle. Um, I do consulting work. That involves, you know, exchange of currency. 
Um, next, travel time and games. Why do you think so many people today just hand wave travel and games? I feel like players are missing, missing so much in games by not doing it. I agree. I agree. I believe that if you finish up in this, whatever you were doing, this recovery, whatever, and, and you're, you know, a, a distance away from your base or where you started out from or whatever, that you should play, play out the trip. I think outdoor adventuring is every bit as much fun every bit as much fun if it's done well and done right with the, in the right spirit i don't know why hand people people hand wave it i well i think i do it's because it wastes time and they're trying to get their hero more powerful in another level and who wants to fool around with you know climbing through poison ivy and quicksand some of them anyway you mentioned different characters having different speeds. Well, I'll go a step further. One thing about being lost in a modern in 5e generation is they're making everyone the same. Yeah, um, that's 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 old news. Um, and I'm not putting you down for your observation. Don't don't get me wrong. Um, that's that's the worst thing that a lot of people feel about 5e is the homogenization. Um, with the release of Larian Studios, Smash Head, Ball, okay, well, here we are, Baldur's Gate again. Um, okay, so there's a lot of people are saying, oh my God, that's it, It'll, there'll never be a better one done. Uh, it's an anomaly and not the new normal for other games to acquire, aspire to. Is there any time you can think of in tabletop RPGs when someone came up with a new game system or a certain adventure, perhaps it was thought to be too good, as it were? No, hell no. If we thought it was any good at all, we tried to sell it. Um, yeah. <laughs> if it, hey, can we make money on this? Let's give it a try. Will the, will fans enjoy, will the players enjoy it? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Do I have a home campaign world or just play one-offs? Do I use Greyhawk ever? I have a home world called Makanda. I've written up a great deal of backstory and history on it. Today I only run one-offs because number one, I'm going on 75 years old and I don't think I'll be setting up another RPG group. So I may do a world book one day, or I may just release it as a story. I don't know, but I have, I, yeah, I have, there is a home world and there's a long history. And um, I had a map that I developed 12, 13 years ago of um, the continents when they sundered. Do I ever use Greyhawk? No. No, I've never used Greyhawk. I've admired the maps, I've read through it. But I, I wasn't I don't I don't didn't do campaigns like that. We all have a different I've never had a regular uh D and D group since Carbondale. I was part of a regular group in Geneva, Lake Geneva. I'm not going to start one up now. Though if somebody in my area, my local library or whatever, wanted to get one off the ground, I'd certainly give them all the help I could to do that. Okay, AD&D 2nd did come out with the battle system miniatures rules in 1989 and later with Skirmisher Miniatures Rules in 91. Okay, apparently, apparently they weren't all that great or they would have leaked out because Skirmish Rules particularly are, are very, very, very popular in Europe. And they would seem to be a, a, 
an outgrowth of D&D, what I would call medium-scale actions, but they never caught on, which is a shame. Um, the other movie I, or the other game I liked playing was Wizard. The movie came out when Star Wars came out in '77. Uh, I never played that, so I couldn't. I couldn't comment on that. Um, okay. All right. There's a lot of questions. This next, this last question here is kind of involved. Um, making it, it, making sense of failed roles. Now, this assumes that, okay, I didn't make the die roll. This is giving, he suggests, or there is a system or a, a, an ethic in playing um, that gives a reason. Uh, well, let me let me try to read it. Um, I came across the notion of framing failure misrolls so that it's not a matter of incompetence. The PC doesn't fail because they screwed up, because of mitigating factors such as running out of time to complete a task, or didn't get a chance to focus, or they were interrupted, not having the right tool. Um... All right, I want, to, I want to think very carefully. I'm going to answer this because I'm going to piss some people off. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not in favor of going, um, oh, it wasn't that you were incompetent. It's just it was a very tricky lock that you failed. No, you tried to pick the lock. You failed. Okay, big deal. You failed. Failure saving throw on lots of things. It happens. Luck of the draw, living life, whatever. Um, trying to rationalize it sounds like you're um, influenced by the trophy generation, the participation trophy generation. Oh, it's not your fault. Hey, life's tough. You didn't get the lock open. Maybe I'm just a hard ass. I don't know. But. I never felt I had to explain why they failed. No, that's the other part. Would I endorse that? No, no, you failed. <laughs> Let's move on. Try again or do something else. You fail. Yeah, all right. Um, I don't feel I have to reach out and pat the player character on the shoulder. Oh, it's too bad. Don't feel bad about it. Well, you failed. That's all there is. Oops, okay, I failed. And I guess that's about all I got. Um, go to Mud Puppy Games and leave a crater. <laughs> There's so many connotations you can put on that. That's why I like it. Um, see you next time. No doubt to go away. Hello, and welcome to my son. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man round when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPG. What the feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. Brought psionics to the 
game, we would attack that wizard's brain. DSR and fantasy, collection of micro armory, tight with tramp under a tree. Pie as could be, he's the curmudgeon, we wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar, talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Come on.